20 years ago, I discovered online, as I discovered the net, uh, this mailing list called 7-Eleven. I don't know if any of you know about it. And I started uh, meeting people from Ludmilla. Uh, and you know, we created all these projects. I was in California, and people were here, and in Moscow, and in Britain. And uh, that was my first encounter with the brilliant minds of Ljubljana. So anyway, thank you for having me. I'm going to um, talk tonight about a decade-long project. So I'm going to be showing more than I'm going to be speaking. I'll talk a little at the beginning to frame things. The project concerns itself with the uh, intimate ways that people interact with and come to depend on the tools largely built as we all know, <laughs> by the US military primarily and also by Silicon Valley, that today impact nearly um, all aspects of our lives, from our desires to what we know, to what we see, to what we exchange, to how we find our lovers, to uh, knowledge, acquisition, and essentially shape and alter who we are right, and what we see and know, and the truths that we tell about ourselves and the world. So my work specifically is grappling with what's at stake when the ground, uh, or as the ground, continues to fall out from the poor and the middle class and secure jobs disappear. I mean, we were talking about that. You know, what happens when there's no safety net, when inequality increases as it has, and political divides in sort of deepen. And this has all been happening alongside of, you know, the great development of the internet that we all, you know, need and love and use. And so my work looks at the kind of paradoxes and the contradictions within that question, and also uh, the kinds of paradoxes that emerge or sort of possibilities that emerge within this system itself that are on the one hand, you know, sort of the systems individuate, they isolate, they monetize selves. And then also on the other hand, they, there's a, at least the, what I try to uncover in, in the work that I'll show you are imminent assemblages of social formations or kind of an emergent uh, form of publicness or uh, social arrangements that, um, as Marco said yesterday, might possibly exceed capitalist capture. I began this, this work that now it's 2017, and I finally finished uh, the final chapter of, a, of one piece that I started in 2009, but the work began during the, fi the global financial crisis in 2008. I actually like to think of it, I don't know if I like to, but I kind of think of it as, as covering an era. You know, that starts, starts with Obama. I talk about it specifically as in an American context, um, but I think it can be expanded as can populist movements and the rise of, of uh, you know, sort of the right wing across the world um, or across the West. But so it starts uh, with Obama being elected with the, in 2008 and with the financial crisis and ends pretty much when uh, Trump was elected. And I said I wouldn't talk about Trump, so I won't go into that anymore, <laughs> except tangentially. And when I began, social media was also exploding. It had been around, but it was really exploding. And YouTube had been around for, or had been bought by Google just a couple of years ago. Uh, iPhones were uh, just being introduced, you know, again, a couple of, for a couple of years, but people were still making, uh, spending a lot of time in front of their desktops in computers, you know, sort of attached to uh, cables in the wall. It was a more innocent time <laughs> in many ways, and that this was before Twitter took off and before online shaming got as bad as it is now before Arab Spring, you know, sort of rose and then collapsed uh, before Black Lives Matter. And the videos that I collected, because I, I began to collect videos of people kind of uh, performing and speaking and gesturing and dancing and, uh, and ranting in front of uh, cameras attached to the internet. Uh, but the videos convey a, what looks like now to be just a kind of shocking trust 
you know, a trust with a computer, a trust with strangers on the internet, and in and and a kind of presentation of the self in in disarmingly vulnerable ways. And at the time, 2008, 2009, you have people like Clay Shirky and others uh, gushing over the democratic po you know, potential of collaborative communication and you know, Wikipedia and how all of this was going to, uh, you know, all of this free labor that people were doing for love. Um, and I wanted to offer a more complicated picture. Um, and I thought that there was something you know, weird and interesting and disturbing about these, these videos, these you know, kind of confessional, what seemed like confessional, but uh, sort of uh, self-portraits, and that were both you know, extremely private and extraordinarily public, and that they seemed to be pointing to the kind of, a, a kind of uh, you know, sort of deep gap or absence of public space, of, of kind of social connection, of commonality, yet at the same time, you know, this, this longing or this impulse, you know, however, however, you know, sort of trite it might seem, because most of this stuff people didn't look at, they just thought of it as disposable, people made them really quickly, but they seem to me to be some kind of gesture, you know, sort of of a, of a desire or a demand to be seen, to be heard, like to be somehow you know, visible in a, in, in a, you know, sort of arena where people felt completely absent or not seen. I think that this kind of, what I try to dig up in this work is a, a, a kind of in, imminent form that sort of points to some of that, that points to this desire or maybe even reality of, of people acting together and I'm thinking about this specifically since the conversation yesterday, but this, this shift uh, or this slow kind of maybe suggestion of this movement from the neoliberal I, you know, the enforced I, the single, to, to some kind of a we that I never used the word before now, but you know, that might suggest a condividuality. <laughs> you know, this is a new word for me, but you know, I mean, it's something I need to think about more what that is, but I. But, uh, I mean, Marco said something, I don't know if any of you speak Spanish, but like, compartir, you know, to share, like the translation into Spanish, when he said that it, as an English speaker, you know, that it started to make more sense to me. So, um, one more thing to say before I show you some things is, I think about this project, and I'm thinking now of, of Gerald's talk where he, you were talking about, you know, people need to, I don't remember exactly how you put it, but, uh, you know, sort of cause trouble uh, with machine intelligence or, you know, sort of exactly how you said it, but it was like there's some way that we need to, you know, sort of look to that. And I think about this work, I didn't necessarily think about it in 2008 when I started, but I think now looking back of it as a collaboration that I was having with Google's, you know, emerging machine intelligence. Uh, collaboration and also intervention into it. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, so I collected masses of videos, and with those videos, I put them together into a kind of semantic uh, associations, not that different from, well, different and not different from the way that Google, you know, returns search results, or when you watch a YouTube video, you get you know suggestions or Netflix you get suggestions you know so you get something that seems like something else and and uh, so what I was doing is I was you know looking for videos on certain themes and I would I would uh, search into the bait you know into the bottom of the of the search results like instead of the top results which um, you know, were based on my search history and my preferences, you know, I tried to circumvent that and just to keep digging and to, you know, dig into different kinds of variations and to try to rescue the videos that are lost, that are invisible, that don't get, that don't rise to the top because they're not, they're not going to make money for, you know, the search engine. You know, so there was that kind of rescuing or, you know, uh, you know, making visible certain kinds of videos that, uh, that, that only two people in the world watched, you know, me and the maker. <laughs> and, the, and then the other, the other thing was, uh, you know, in, in making associations uh, that the algorithm wouldn't make. 
Um, and that my associations that I made, I made through spatial ma uh, montages that were visible. So you could see my biases, you know, as opposed to uh, Google's associations or algorithms, you know, that are invisible and opaque and you don't see, you know, it, you, you are returned information or, you know, so-called knowledge, all of the world's knowledge, you know, as if it's natural, as if it's just the way it is. I'm guessing that most people here don't know my work, um, and so I'm going to um, start with the beginning, which is a work that I completed that year that I started, which, well, in 2009, entitled Mass Ornament. And it's, a, it's an installation where I collected videos of people dancing in front of their cameras and turned it into a mass dance. And the installation part of it is important because the work is very much about embodiment, uh, and so it's a it's only a you know poor cousin for you to see it as a projection. But you know you can use your imagination, and I think you're an imaginative group. But I want to just frame it a little so you could kind of at least get a sense of what it what it's meant to be. So mass ornament, as some of you probably know, um, comes from. Uh, an essay by a German uh, writer, Siegfried Krakauer, who in 1927 wrote an essay where he was looking at uh, chorus line dancers, which was a popular entertainment form of that period of the 1920s. And he was, he was looking at, at them as a kind of aesthetic manifestation of the economic system at the time, of Fordism. And he said that, or he was arguing, and I'm simplifying, but that you know the the line of 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 women dancing and the way that they moved their bodies in sync was just like the way that workers in a factory were moving their bodies in sync, where they became, you know, kind of uh, they became just the limb, you know, that that they 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 lost their full full personhood uh, and in order to create something together bigger than themselves. And that thing that was bigger than themselves in the factory you know, was capital, which they had no direct association with. So there was a kind of alienation effect that he was trying to describe that he thought that people loved the dances because in some ways they reflected back to them their conditions. And so I was looking in, in 2008 at like, what was similar and what was different about these really popular videos of people, you know, kind of posing in front of their camera and, and, and dancing, um, which is not something that you really, most people, you know, sort of were spending a lot of time thinking about except, uh, yeah, period. <laughs> so, um, and what I, what I was kind of considering is that in 2008, you know, people are no longer managed in a factory in the same way that they're self-managed or that, you know, instead of uh, valuing like the market, instead of valuing um, everyone being the same, valued um, difference, valued individuality. But in that individuality, people were, you know, still behaving in the same way. And so I was looking at the way that, you know, kind of mass culture was embodied in these, in these uh, movements, but also uh, how there was a way that there was also resistance within that, like that there was some kind of uh, pushing against the, 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 the constraints um, and the, uh, you know, that the bodies that were performing the mass culture were also not the idealized bodies that they were, you know, sort of aspiring to. That, that so there was there was just something to me that was not like a completely alienating effect uh, happening. Last thing I'll say about it is that the soundtrack uh, is really important in the installation. You're surrounded by sound. It, it uh, different sounds come out of different speakers, but. It's uh, primarily three tracks. One is a mixing of two films from the 1930s uh, that represent uh, kind of two poles of, of synchronized movements. One is Busby Berkeley's uh, Gold Diggers of 1935. And the second one is Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will. So you know you have fascism on the one hand and Hollywood on the other hand. And then the third sounds that you hear are sounds that I added of bodies you know, in the specific spaces. So I tried to individuate as I was abstracting with separate sounds, with, uh, I mean, separate frames with separate bodies, kind of thumping and breathing and uh, kind of uh, making somehow visible their physical presence. Okay, so I'm gonna show you uh, the video.
When I finished Mass Ornament, I started working with vlogs, video diaries where people were expressing themselves and talking uh, to uh, themselves on the screen, uh, connected. And I did a series called Testament, which uh, is composed of a series of chapters. Each one is its own separate vignette. Uh, and I did three in 2008, and I finished the final one this summer. And it took me a really long time. I mean, it's not, actually, I put it aside for a long time because I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. So Testament, I think about if, uh, you know, if, you're, if I think about the uh, mass ornament as a chorus line, I think about uh, Testament as a Greek choir where in Greek theater, uh, ordinary people stand between the people in power, uh, like the gods and the kings who are performing in the center. And then you have a, a chorus of ordinary people from the town, you know, just regular people who are mediating, uh, commenting on the action of the kings, mediating between the audience and, and those in power. And all of this work, actually, I think about as, you know, sort of the way that ordinary people are negotiating this, this kind of, the, you know, larger, these larger structures, that it's their, you know, sort of uh, their way of being within the systems and also, you know, sort of responding or, or acting, acting within them. With the first three uh, chapters of Testament, I did what I explained before, that is I spatialized the montage. I, I kind of repeated uh, concept, like sort of formally what I was uh, speaking about conceptually, that is that I was trying to show interdependences and potential affinities and commonalities between you know, separate, stranger you know, sort of selves that are not in the same time and space. In the montage, Every uh, frame needs the next frame in order to produce a full picture. So you need, you know, each one depends on the next one to complete an action or to complete an idea. And so I wanted to kind of speak to how, like, one needed to be there for the other. Like, you couldn't really, it co wouldn't work on its own. Uh, with Count, the final chapter, it's a little bit different. Uh, it, I, it's a stacked montage rather than a spatial one. There's no simultaneity, there's no chorus. And instead, people either with great disappointment or with tremendous satisfaction give a number. And they, they count. And they count backwards from 300-something uh, to 100-something. And uh, do you use pounds or stones here? I don't want to give it away, but... <laughs> The one thing I'll say about, about it is that uh, it seems like in some ways that it, it's as if people are reminding, uh, reminding us, or it's a reminder that all efforts online to express oneself on platforms lead to, you know, kind of binary, algorithmic uh, ingestion. The other thing is that I just, uh, I've always showed the separate chapters when I'm giving talks as, as videos, um, but it really, they're really an ins installation. And so uh, last week, I, I made a, uh, I, I, tried to, I tried to create a composite space, you know, from a bunch of different photographs and a bunch of different videos. I've never seen it projected on the screen, but I'm really curious how it works. But I wanted to give a sense more of, of it being, you know, something in which there's, there are, you know, sort of that you need to be there in order to experience the work that this is, you know, this is just an approximation. So you can tell me later what you think. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through, uh, we don't have tons of time, I'm going to go through uh, the first chapter, which is four minutes, and then the second one, which is one minute, and then I'm going to jump to count. So the whole thing will be about five minutes. So today, really? I enter really? a new phase Sucked. in my life. I went into work. work. Like any other day. And my clock in card is missing. And uh, so my manager comes up to me. One of our directors like, called me into an office. My bosses called me um, in the office and said, uh, I talk, talk to you. To you. And, and I, was, I wasn't sure what was going on. I was but, um, expecting I something bad to happen. And basically one of the larger people in the company and someone from Human Resources was there. And next thing you know, the hiring manager walked in. And, and he started off with, well, this is a part of the job I really don't like. And this I'm like, Jesse, 
You what the fuck? Go. Um, and what's going on? You tell me I'm like, unemployed. You fire me? Fired, so like, no. He says yes. We're gonna. They were like, the route's not making enough money. We're I really said no. Sorry. When does it start? You're a really great worker, but unfortunately, unfortunately the business, business has not been good. The guys have been sitting around the I shop. Just sit around in large numbers. People that were walking by to come over and then they finally the owner cut everybody's hours down to like nothing and uh, myself and a lot of other people between my center and the other center like the city, and the city. my people. entire department 600 was people were laid, laid off. off which is it's not a good thing due to financial reason the company is shutting down the company's going the company out of business to close. Day. my position at work my Position became redundant. No more. My son got rid of the go. position. I got downside. I've been removed recessed. from my duties. Suspended. Whatever. Fired. Whatever word you want to use. They're outsourcing my job. I have been there. working at that place for nine years. Ten years. Two years. years. Eight months. Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. Three years. Twenty-five years. Three and a half years. Since I was sixteen, December of '06. And it was just like, wow. As you can imagine, this came as a total shock. I'm in shock. Um, oh, I've as I've been there three months, I've always never worked once hard, had always anybody given sit me down to community and say they were happy with the quality of my work or the speed at which I was really, working. Really I feel betrayed. The way I conducted myself. I feel betrayed. Feel good. How I dealt with people, etc. It was very shocking. I, I didn't realize it was pretty coming. Pretty okay. didn't, didn't um, coming. Um, some people um, were aware of it kind of happening. I just didn't see it coming at all. Be so sudden. So, <clears throat> some good news. Good news is that I'll get a chance to now work on my work on work. more work on my skills to to pursue what I really want. And, and right now, you know, I actually I, I feel kind of kind of liberated. I think it's positive. I feel pretty positive. I feel pretty good about my situation. I was kind of excited to get the hell out of I'm there. I'm actually kind of looking forward to having a little time. Oh, my hands to make More time to laser out of the house. To do clean. Stuff around the house. Read. I think I haven't had enough Watch time to be reckless. Spend yeah. with Get my yard City cleaned up and my job. Maybe I'll go on vacation. Make some yeah. YouTube videos. I might as well make some videos. Maybe do video blog. Uh, I think I'm going to go into I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. I guess we'll see. Monday, I'll go to the uh, Virginia Employment Commission, and I'm going to start looking, looking for a new job. job. Uh, probably get a better job, better. along with 600 others that will be also trying to find a job. So yeah, now I'm uh, fighting for my life, basically. I could use your prayers for and, uh, another job. As I say, some asshole uh, on top of his pile. We don't know what God has planned right now. But, Still got uh, his Mercedes and his million pound. We're just trusting that. Uh, Hopefully, they'll let me stay on as a company driver. Too. So, anyway, folks, anyway, that's my story. Have a good evening. And have a good weekend. Uh, pretty Talk much that's about it. Yeah. And uh, myself and other a lot of other people, people knocking on my door want money. That's about it. Anyway, I'm going to turn this camera around, so I'm going to stop. So, one thing I'll say is that uh, it, when you hear this in a, and it's spread out, you. The sounds are not overlapping in the same way. You kind of they're stretched out, so you know it becomes a little bit harder to hear it when it's compressed on the screen. But in, when you hear people talking, you know you can kind of move towards one or the other in the, in you know when the sound is spread. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my medications. I'm on Depakote, Depakote 500 milligrams. I'm on sure. Seroquel. 50 milligrams once before bedtime. I'm taking Geodon, Risperdal, Flexa. 40 milligrams of Prozac and half a milligram of Xanax at night. I'm in the process of switching medication. From Amlexin to Carbamazepine, and Flexalopram to Christique. And. Now I'll only take Ambien, and I'm feeling really much better. One ninety six. 195 194 193.8 192 191 190 189 even um 188 
187. Okay. So you could tell me later if you know what they're counting. <laughs> Wait, you got that? Okay. <laughs> Usually it takes a, I mean, I, I actually have just showed it, I showed it for the first time in, the, there's in a biotial in Germany. Right now it's up there, but, so I haven't really uh, gotten to uh, hear, you know, how long it takes before you, 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 you get that. But the weight, you know, is in pounds. So it starts from being, you know, quite, quite large to being quite thin. So. I wasn't going to talk about this next piece, but after yesterday, I thought that I would because I think that there's some kind of strange, interesting way that it intersects with, with the conversation. Uh, and so the, the next piece that I did that was a part of this body of work is called uh, Now He's Out in Public and Everyone Can See. And it was, it was a piece that I began working on at the, at the beginning of this period, um, when, which I'm going to go back to the... Obama administration that when Obama was elected, there was in America, you know, this resurgence of, of a kind of outward display, especially on the internet, of white raci racist resentment that had always been there and that was always experienced by people of color, but that was just, you know, it just exploded. And uh, at the time, there were also, you know, a series of, of, of partly media constructed uh, scandals involving a number of very famous African American men. And uh, the piece itself is a collection of uh, narrations by people talking about these scandals. And I create a narrative uh, in which I weave in and out the uh, different scandals to construct you know, a kind of meta scandal. And I never name, I, I remove the names of the, of the people involved at the time that they're being spoken about. So as a viewer, you know, you're always uh, sort of catching it, you know, recognizing a name and then misrecognizing it. Or it moves from one scandal that you may or may not recognize to another until, you know, it ultimately becomes just about the way that the language keeps repeating and keeps moving in and out of every, every discussion about African American men uh, who ha are in uh, positions of power that are historically and still at the time and still today dominated by white men. And the kind of scandal that seems to be produced simply by the fact of the men being in public, being in those spaces, being in, you know, being visible, stepping, you know, sort of outside into, you know, sort of visibility. What I wanted to say in relationship to proper names is that each of the men have uh, proper names. They're associated with power, with, with tremendous power. Uh, but it matters much less than the categories of identity that are assigned to them by others. Uh, and so there, you know, that's something that we, we haven't really talked about, but the, you know, sort of like when does a proper name you know, sort of hold weight and when sort of overcome by the categories of you know, race, of gender, of other kinds of you know, sort of ways that people are defined. So originally, when I showed this work, it was an 18-channel installation that immersed people, uh, that completely surrounded viewers, and you were constantly moving your body to try to follow the story, and the, you know, the narrative kept slipping away as the images kept slipping away, so you were you know, sort of really active in it. Um, I remade it into a film this year, 
uh, because it seemed in a, in a very creepy way to, you know, kind of speak to the emergence of, uh, you know, the tribalism that we are now experiencing and the uh, internet uh, echo chambers where fact and fiction are indistinguishable, where, you know, sort of sensible voices and, and racist voices kind of are leveled within that space. And so... Uh, it's a hard film for me to, for I think, to watch right now uh, because it's it's so in, even as it's uh, you know footage that I collected in 2009 through 2011, it it just speaks to this kind of emergence of something that we're now suffering through. So it's 24 minutes, and I'm going to show you about four minutes. I'm going to start at the beginning for about a minute, and then I'll jump in. And I'm showing you not the documentation of the installation, but the film. I have the feeling that this could have turned out differently had things not progressed the way that they had. But before we jump to conclusions, we need to I'm make sure we have all the go straight to the facts. facts. Regarding the situation, you know, here are the, are the facts. facts. It's April 27th, 2011. And you can make your own decision. And this just happened. Too much to talk about it right now. Let's just look at the facts. This dude, who also happens to be a black man, he's no blacker than I am, really. I mean, if you look past skin tone. I don't know what race you are. No one knows the first thing about him. Even his name is a mystery. That's insane. What a joke. It sounds fishy. Can you explain this? Anything nowadays could be true. Please state your full name in place of birth. Why, Why won't you produce, produce the real, his actual, official, long form, authenticated, authentic, original birth certificates? What is the problem with that? It's a fake. I don't know if it's real or not. It's such an obvious fake. I don't think that there is a record. If there is evidence, I haven't seen any evidence. Why not show the evidence? It is probably a forgery. He's lying about his name. No one knows the first thing about him. Even his name is a mystery. There was what I would say was in his Michael Jackson slash OJ moment, right? Where he just jumped the shark. Released an animal. In terms of some of this racial stuff. Released the inner animal in him. We've already seen him, you know, with Reverend Wright and dissing his white grandmother. They have a completely different psychological makeup than we do. Men of power. Kobe Bryant, Bill Clinton. Have always. Are biologically driven. Over a history. Kings um, of the past. Famous people, especially men. Especially kings. It's like King David and Solomon. Even here back in the biblical times, King Solomon or King David. They're physically wired in a totally different way than we are. There is no way that he's going to be faithful. His nature. When your testosterone, testosterone level runs high. So they're actually a lot more sexual. You know, you've probably seen this in science class, but they are very different, and so they think very different. He's the most desirable guy as far as females are concerned in the world. I mean, crap, if I was a girl, I would like him. He can get anybody he wants at any time. And he's had sex with, like, all the white women in the whole world. He probably has women all over sucked into the dojo. What's wrong with you, buddy? Can't keep the black dragon in the pants? Let me pause here for a second and say I am not, not racist, racist you know, whatsoever. At all. I am not. And I am nothing against black people whatsoever. I'm not meaning to be racist at I'm all. I'm not being racist or anything, but I'm just saying. I'm Totally not I rich. value I black, black friends, friends of all races. I have many ethnic Hispanic friends. I have many white friends. I have many Jewish friends. I think. And I don't think I'm a racist at all. Uh, I grew up and had many good friends that were black. I have lots of black friends I grew up with. I mean, I grew up surrounded by black people. I knew lots of black I'm, people. I love. I have no problem that he's African American. I could care less about the color of his skin. I don't mind the fact that he's black. At all. I love black people. I think they're really cool. But. but. 
Okay. So thank you.